This is The Dodcast. I'm your host, Nathaniel Dodson. In today's podcast, I sat down with Justin James Muir, a Philadelphia area photographer who is arguably one of the best photographers in the country. The smooth colors, the sublime use of light and shadow, the depth of field, and the location light he captures are only a few of the things that will convince you that his work is a cut above the rest of us. We talk a whole lot about commercial photography, working with top photographer Joey L, working as a creative director for a big TV channel, photographing chickens with his personal chicken whisperer, the challenges of marketing yourself as a photographer, landing magazine photo jobs, Netflix addictions, and a whole lot more in this, the eighth episode of The Dodcast. <laughs> All right, welcome into The Dodcast, everybody. It's my podcast where I talk about things that I'm interested in with people who are usually cooler than myself. And today I've got Justin James Muir, who I think, I always tell people when I talk about you, you're the best photographer in the Philadelphia area. It's a, it's a giant, giant claim. It, but it's true. <laughs> All you have to do is take a look at your stuff. There's this feeling I get, and I'm not really a feelings kind of guy, but there's a <laughs> feeling I get when I see photos that you take, whether it's your chickens or whether it's some corporate portrait you've done for Philly Mag or whatever, whoever you're working for at the moment. That just makes me go, it's right. The light's right. The cinematic feel is right. The editing's right. The color's right. Oh, there's somebody in the photo. Look at that. Everything about it is just right. I don't know how you do it. Good way to start off the podcast, <laughs> right off of the compliments. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate that. No, you're it, you're good. You're really, really good. You you told me earlier you grew up in Rhode Island. How'd did. you how'd you get into photography? Is it something you've been in for No, actually I was talking to her earlier. Um uh was in a band for a long time, um, t- toured and put out records and did that whole thing. And it was always part of the, the, uh, the visual part of the, the band. So every like video that we did, every design that we did, everything, I was always kind of part of that or the leader of that. Um, and I went to school for design. And in about, I think, 2010, I'm going to guess, 2010, my mom got me a camera for Christmas, just like a little old shitty rebel it used to actually be my aunt's camera. It was like a six six megapixel, uh, megapixel camera, just terrible. terrible ISO camera. you can use up to like eight hundred. Yeah, it was just terrible. <laughs> um, I, I don't have it anymore. I sold it. I wish I actually kept it. Yeah. Um, and I just started shooting every day and just kept going and was uh, an art director between that time and uh, uh, when I started full time photography and would shoot a ton and direct a lot of photo shoots and, and come up with concepts for the company I worked the for. The art director that was QVC? Yep. Is that right? Yeah, and How I was, worked for another co- company called Animal in Providence. Oh, okay. How was it working with QVC? Oh, it was great. I loved it. Uh, I moved here in 2010 without a thought of what I was going to do for work. After the band stopped playing, I was like, hmm, I guess I'll just freelance design for a while. And I was going to do that, and then my now wife, then girlfriend, was like, QVC is literally down the street from us. They're always hiring. It's a big company. A lot of visual a lot stuff of visual going on stuff. Yeah, she's there. like, just check if they have any openings. And I started out in design there for the first year and then went to uh, art director. Oh, uh, shoot, after okay. That. So, like, just right, literally moved here and started the job that same week. Cause I Nice. That's the here. way to do it, I though. know. It, 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 like, went from zero to ten in, like, two seconds. So after the band broke up, this was up in New England. Yep. Why here outside of Philly? Like, what brought you to... Music brought me here. Okay. My, we toured through Westchester, which is where we are right now, and we played a club called The Note, um, okay. which was Bam Margera's old club um, that... He, just actually a really cool club, and we toured through here twice, and my wife was the bartender, and I met her, and then the rest is history. Gotcha. So there, now I know why you came to the Yeah, end. exactly. So yeah. then when I was mo- like, I was still in Rhode Island and wanted to move somewhere else, was going to go to California, didn't know where I was going to go. I had some friends, different places. And she was like, you can come here. So yeah, came here. that's cool. It's a nice little place. It's a nice spot. I love West. And now I love Pennsylvania. Yeah. Never thought I would live in Pennsylvania, but I love it. Pennsylvania, I feel like is like an Ohio kind of state where it's like, why would you ever move there? Right. It's just well, kind of a box there. It Nobody is. talks about it. It gets a bad rap, I think, but I do really love it. I've learned to really love it. So. It's not Florida. It's not California. Yeah. It's, not, it's none of the, none of that stuff. No East coast is Florida. Or so did California. you, did you ever meet Bam? Oh uh, yeah. 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 Is he a pretty cool guy? Yeah, he's a nice guy. I've saw, I saw recently, I don't know if it was vice or somebody did something on YouTube. Uh, well, at least I saw the video on YouTube where it was like, hey, 
the rise to the pinnacle of where he was and like came crashing down. He gained all this weight. Yeah. And, you know, it was kind of like he was, they, at least the documentary portrayed him as a little bit of a mess. Yeah. And then he's like, enough. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. Uh, you know, I haven't talked to him in a long, long time, but interesting cat. He seems laid back. Yeah. Never photographed him. I did. Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah. He, for what? uh, just personal stuff for, he used to ask me to photograph him for random things. Uh, like, and then one time we just, uh, he's one thing for a, he put out a, a record with a kind okay. of like a, he was the leader of a band, but I'm not sure if he was the singer. He was just kind of, I don't really know what he did, <laughs> okay. but I did the okay. cover of that. And then so just a personal project for myself. I think it's still on the website. I'm not positive though. Oh shoot. Okay. So after you, you, you spent what, about two, three years at QVC? Uh, three years. Three years. Uh, no, a little less, like two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half. Why did they fire you? Why'd you leave? No, I left cause it's right when photography. So I was basically working two full-time jobs. I was doing QVC and working on my photography career. And it's when they kind of like met financially a little. And yeah, I was, you need the, the money where you can, I can jump yeah, out of my right. Own so oh. at that, at that point, QVC was kind of, it was a great job and I loved it. Um, you know, different environment than I'm used to, but, um, when kind of I was doing enough work where I could support myself and see a path forward, that's when I jumped ship. And, you know, QVC allowed me to ha like kind of get a little stash of money for uh, equipment and, you know, kind of start in that realm. Yeah. So take, you need the, the initial nugget. Yeah, you do. Because it's not a cheap uh, profession to start. <laughs> what kind of stuff are you shooting now? Uh, it's still always just portraiture. I try to stick with people. I mean, landscapes sneak in there once in a while, but that's just cause I like traveling. Yeah. I realize they kind of are sore thumbs within my portfolio, but mm -hmm. I, I like them. Um, it's still you. Right. Yeah. I enjoy doing it. So I'm like, eh, this is, I like right, it. If you do what you do because you love it. Right. You, you can't be all business all the time. Right. That's kind of the way I look at yeah. it. Yeah. And I also feel like I've worked with clients. They haven't come out and said it directly, but I get the feeling that they hire me because it's, there's a little bit of personality that I've put forward, whether it's in our meetings or on my website or whatever it is right. and kind of looking through something. If it feels too, quite frankly, if it feels too well put together and too expensive, some people are never going to reach out anyway. Yeah. Right. Totally. But if I feel like if I just put out work that is the best that I can do, at least at this point, always looking to get better, of course, the best that I can do right now and mixing stuff that's just like, I like this stuff. That's why I tell my wife all the time. You wake up, do the best you can, you go to sleep. That's it. That's all you got to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So if, if do, would you be able to name, like, this is my ideal client or is just somebody that wants beautiful portraits? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm always drawn to just, like, I like the editorial feel of the portraiture when there's a story to be told about something and you're kind of implemented into that story and you have to, you know, do something to kind of help with that within one frame. Can you give me an of, example? Uh, like the last thing I did for Philly Mag for the Vince uh, Fumu piece, uh, I think it's pronounced Fumu, Fumo. Okay, Fumo? I'm not uh, sure. He's an old senator of, uh, of Pennsylvania. Sounds uh, sounds likely to me. Uh, but you know, basically, it would, the whole piece was talking about his rise and fall. He ended up going to jail for some corruption charges. Um, he's got some stories. I yeah, think. and he was a really nice guy. He actually was considered a, a really good senator um, and a good good representative, but he just did some shady things and uh, you know, the story was pretty in depth and pretty long and, you know, had two images to kind of show it. And when I was going for, you know, when I was planning for the shoot, I didn't want to make him look evil and I didn't want to make him look too like saintly. saintly. So yeah. tried to, I, you know, merge the two and kind of create this drama and kind of intrigue into what they were talking. So about. what's that process like for you? Philly mag, this is who the client was, right? Yep, yep. Philly mag comes to you. We got this story. Are they giving you the story? They are giving me the story. Yes. Okay. Sometimes they don't have it. Sometimes okay. like they'll be writing it while and I'm will there. They, will they like have some cliff notes they can give you? I'm guessing. Yeah, so they right? give me the whole article. So, so the, they give you the article. Yep. So you're reading that. Are you doing independent research yeah. on this guy outside of that? And then are you developing a mood board? Like, what's the process for you to know? Because like you just said, I didn't want to make him look evil. I didn't want to make him look right. too saintly. So how are you figuring out, all right, this is the frame. I got this idea in my head. I want to try to shoot this It goes shot. different all the time. Sometimes they'll come. They didn't do this with this shoot, but sometimes they'll come and be like, hey, we like this shot of yours. We're looking for something similar. Okay. And then, you know, go back and forth. This one, they didn't really give me anything because it was an on location shoot. So they didn't give me any reference. And uh, Claudia, who's the photo editor there, was pretty open to whatever I wanted. So do, we did, do you prefer when they come to you and it's like blank canvas, yeah, yeah, baby? Yeah, yeah, totally. Do whatever we want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like nice that to... way better. I mean, I'll, it is nice to know what people want ahead of time because then you can at least have a conversation. Most people are, are, are relatively open if it's especially editorial for kind of a little moving right. and shaking because not all the yeah. time. You don't always have a ton of time. Production's not always big. So you have these limitations. So it's just right. nice to know what people want up front. Yeah, of course. Yeah.
that's that's super cool. And then you'll so you'll go to the shoot and you just do you work. Do you have a lot of assistants you work with? You do a lot uh, of stuff yourself. It depends yourself. on the shoot. Like for something like that, I just bring two assistants. Um, we had to, he gave us a decent amount of time because I think he was coming out with a book, so he was a little bit more lenient with. You know, sometimes editorial shoots will give you like two minutes, and you know, here you have an hour to set up and three minutes to shoot. Um, but this was a, we had a little more length. If you ever have an hour to set up, and that's not a lot of time, really. Um, and two minutes to shoot, that's fine. If everything's set, right? It's just like, yeah. do your thing. And then the two, you're on for two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever, because I've done this before, where I'll I'll know that I got something coming up. And I, if I can get, scout out the location, I'll do like a Google Maps drive by, oh, there's a window on that side of the building. Okay, right. got that. The sun will be about in this spot in the sky during, you know, the, the, the time of day we're doing that yeah. shoot. And then I'll try to mimic the shoot either in my garage or where, you know, in a studio space. yeah. I I'll, I will never I won't do that for like hero shots like the big shot of the but like actually for the Vince Fumo it didn't get published but there was this one idea I wanted I wanted to do a super dramatic lit portrait and I knew it was going to take a decent amount of light setup so I wanted to get the exact thing so I had my buddy who assisted me on the day come in here and we did the light setup and I kind of took pictures of it to make sure I could do it in three seconds. Right, and yeah. so we did that. It didn't end up get published, but I, it's in my portfolio and I really like it. Is that so. the shot where it's a heavy shadow side to yeah. the camera? I yeah, love that yeah, picture. Yeah. I know exactly what picture you're talking yeah. about. So, a great shot. Um, that was one instance. Again, you don't always have the time to do that, but um, you know, I, I try to, if I can. If it's a new setup, if it's like I'm setting something new that I've never done before, but I have it in my head, I'm like, oh, I want this soft light with the you know, harsh, whatever it is, yeah, then yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll set it up beforehand. Oh. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, what's your approach when you're going and lighting? Cause I notice, I always tell people, if you want a cinematic portrait, lay your image. So you have shadow side facing the cameras. I feel like a lot of people are like, I got a front light this. I've got to have a lot of light coming right from in or around the camera source. Right. To me, cinematic lighting is not, it doesn't even have to be a heavy shadow, but if shadow side is toward camera, you almost are always going to get a cinematic look. Totally. Is there a deliberate process you go through when you're lighting? I mean, there has to be, cause you're very I don't know if you're very technical, but your images look very technical. Not very technical. Yeah. <laughs> but your images look very technical. Yeah. So what's the pro like what's going through your head when you're lighting? Are you are you lighting like I'm gonna start with my backlights first? Are you doing something deliberately to try to shape the light, or is it just this feels right? I'm rolling with it. I think it's more the 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 feels right. I don't really have like a I go for this, this, and this. Oh. I really like to like it, it's always different. I don't do the same thing every time. I end up with similar results. Um, but it is about shape. I do look for shaping. And I think when I first started to me, depth in a photo was shooting at 1.8. Like yeah, to me, like that was, but Get I was that 70 to 200. Right, but now I don't see it that way. Like I don't see depth in the same way. I see depth as in the way light shapes. I love that five, six. I love that eight. I love <laughs> right. that 13. Totally. So like if you can shape something, you can make something look like it has more depth than shooting at low, you know, 1.8. But it, the, if the light is shaping things in the frame and, and using you're using light correctly, you don't need that. So, yeah. I mean, you can do both, but I, I, I'm looking at the way depth is put into a picture more than I used to. And speaking of depth, a lot of your pictures, they almost have like a medium format camera vibe. I did that to a them. lot. Yeah. I've yeah, never shot I, medium format. So <laughs> Yeah. it's. I mean, it, you should try it. It's yeah. amazing. Um, but a little bit of a learning curve. Yeah. A lot of a learning curve, actually. But it's a lot of fun. Um, but a lot of your photos do have that vibe and I'm just, I guess, piggybacking on what you just said, there's, there's a photo, there's a photo shoot you did. I think it was Joshua tree. It's a, it's an older fellow with a cowboy hat leaning against the fence. Yep. Um, and also there's another, oh yeah, there you go. Look at that over there on the wall. You guys can't see it. <laughs> um, there's a, that there's that shoot and there's around, around the similar time, at least on your Instagram feed, there is a, a young woman, I believe it's in the front of a car mm -hmm. where it looks like you're lighting through the windshield or yep. back, back window of the car. Both have a very medium format look, those two shoots. And also you just did something recently, the guy in like the gray tweed yep. jacket, yeah, yeah, yeah. really cool stuff. He's like lighting a cigarette, that kind of stuff. Is that like that shoot, right? There's the shot. It's the one in your portfolio. I think a second or third image in your portfolio, right at the time of this recording, at least. Um, is that something where are you, you're lighting that on location? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what's that looking like? One light, two one, light? Uh, most of the time, one. That was, I think, every one of those that you're talking about was one, except for the one in the car. I think there might have been two on some of the shoots. I'm not, which one, I don't know which exact shot you're talking about. But okay. most of the time, on location outdoor, you should be, at least for me, I should be able to do it with one light. Yeah. Because most of the time, it's assessing existing light and adding to it rather than creating your own. So obviously, sometimes you do have to create your light from scratch where you're lighting backgrounds and hair lights and everything from you know 
the entire scene, but with outdoor, a lot of times I'm uh, building upon what already exists. So I'm finding a shot that already looks good. Uh, light wise, even, you know, there's not too much, if you're fighting against light, it's going to look less natural than if you're fighting with light. So if you get a shot that already looks okay and you just add that pop of light there or, or whatever, it's going to just look, it's going to give you that feel, which feels, I guess, which is the, the format people are talking about. Okay. And when you're, when you're looking at that in terms of adding that pop of light, influencing the ambient light. I love the idea of doing that. Right. Because there are a lot of people I see, they throw up a softbox. It's like, up, oh, just drop your exposure so the ambiance is two yeah. stops or three stops darker. And then, But then you get this really weird, it's like I could do that almost with totally. a vignette in Photoshop, and I don't really like that. I don't like to, I don't like to be able to see a light. Uh, this, yeah. is, this is a very personal thing. So some people, uh, there are a lot of photographers that I love that you can see how it's lit and you, can, and you know, and I love that. I think it's great, but that's not what appeals to me. I like when you can't notice there's lights and you can't, tell if someone's like did you like that and, and you can't really know right uh, i mean most people can tell if you see catch lights or like you you know but yeah if you have some idea some idea of photography but if yeah, you yeah. can't tell that's kind of like a win for me. yeah of course so when you're looking at a situation like there in the alleyway i looked like it was shot in an alleyway tweed jacket guy yeah, yeah, yeah. um how are you choosing where you're putting your light like you said you're assessing the situation yeah. is it a matter of all right i want his shadow to be facing me i want to just pepper some light in onto this side of him or how do you pick the side of him? Like what's going through your head? There's like the nitty I get, gritty. I think there's three different things. One is logistics. So like sometimes I'll, there's a dumpster I'll, there, right? That or like, I don't want the light in the frame here. So I have to kind of frame it a little differently. Sometimes I'll like tripod it and put the light in the frame and take it out later. But, mm -hmm. um, most of the time it's just literally adding to the existing light. So here's a spot that I already know looks good. And the light on his face is already almost there. Uh, so I just need to add a little kick to either his left side or his right side or a little dimension on his whole body or something like that. So you're kind of assessing the, you're setting up your shot before you set up any lights. So like, I, that's why I can move pretty quickly, um, and get a ton of those shots with a light. And I'm not sitting there setting up an entire scene because I get my shot with him. I have him in the spot. I know what he want, what I want him to do, the actions that I want him to do. And then I light for that. So it only takes one person with one light kind of maneuvering and understanding right. how I direct them. Okay, nice, nice, nice. That's pretty cool. Um, and it's it's with, with a, something like that, are you, you typically shooting at a very shallow depth of field? I mean, you're not going 1.8 like no, back I, in your old, I, olden I, times. I found 2.2 is like a, for stuff like that, I really like 2.2. And what focal length? Uh, 50. Okay, you're shooting a lot of 50. I say like 50 is probably like... 70% of my portfolio is 50 okay. millimeter. Can't go wrong with the 50. Yeah. Um, the 35 is nice too. 35 is good. I don't but you got it. You got to be willing to get more of that environment. Yeah. With the 35. I, I don't always bring it. I, I'm either shooting super wide or at 50. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty much, it's either 24 or 50. So you're more of a primes guy, not a zooms guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think there's one image in my portfolio higher than 70. Wow. That's impressive though. That's great. I don't really like people that crop in too tightly anyway. It's a little bit, it's a little bit too I, much. The, the 7200 has its place. I just don't like, um, it, it, it compresses stuff a little too much and oh. kind of make things a little flat for my opinion. Yeah. But. You know, I, I used to have the 7200, Mark II, F28, IS, USM, the whole bit, the, the, the best one. Yeah. yeah. At least I use time. it once in a while. I don't know. I got rid of it. I just sold it. Cause, and, and the reason I sold it was because I thought I was number one using it too much. Yeah. And like everyone has it. And I don't, there's, there's, it definitely has a look. The bokeh looks differently. It has a look. And I'm like, I, I want to force myself to use other lenses and it's going to, it's just going to be another level of differentiation totally. between myself and all these other people who I'm competing with and any way that I can stick out. Yeah. There are a lot of photographers that I actually really like that shoot with that lens yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, like a fashion lot. stuff. And I, a lot of studio photographers yeah. that they use it all the time. I think it's great. Uh, it's just, I never feel comfortable with it. So. Yeah. No, I kind of agree. You're a Canon guy, right? Yep. What what cannons do you have? Uh, Mark fours and Mark threes. Okay, and Mark two. And do you did you notice a big difference between the Mark three and the Mark four? Uh, just I think the files are similar. The color is a little different, but the uh, the uh, workability is that the word? The the way it works is a little more intuitive, and there's a little more options in actually shooting with it. So okay. the files I don't I don't see like a crazy difference. They're a little bigger uh, file size, um, but I don't notice like, oh my God, this image is way better. It's just the way the camera works is a lot better. Um, a touch screen, which I never thought I'd like or use or have yeah. any use for, I use a lot. Yeah, I'm um, the same with right. the touch screen. It's yeah. just, I, 
whoa, I never would have realized. Because I, I remember, I think it was Nikon that came out with the first touch screen. Yeah. I was like, what is this? Well, that's this is such I, a gimmick. The the touch focus, I was like, I'm not going to use that. Like, it just yeah. doesn't seem like it would fit in the way I shoot. And I use it all the time. Yeah, because there's times when it's like, whoa, I can do that. I never thought. And in the menu, just being able to browse the menus and stuff like that. It's a hundred. I'm right there with you. It's a hundred percent a thing that I was like, I'm never going to use a touch screen on the back of a camera. But it's just when when it's that the good. wheel and the joystick are yeah. great. <laughs> when it's that good and like the resolution of the images on the back of the screen, I try not to look too much. But when you're shooting and framing up a shot with the screen, it just looks awesome. So it's really easy to use. Do you do you use a histogram? Do you use a light meter? No, I, I'm I'm a terrible. So you just eye, eye it idea. up on the camera. <laughs> No, that's great. This is so funny. I was just talking to somebody about this. There are really, really good photographers that don't care about the technical stuff. And I always feel like you're self-conscious about it. No, I'm not. Like, I'm not I really. Should be, I should understand more about this. It's like, dude, your photos are amazing. Keep, I, don't change. I like, that's what you should be so doing. So I like, when I first started, I would just use Alien Bees. That's all I have is an Alien Bee. So I got really used to the output of an Alien Bee, like an eight, Alien Bee 800. Flip I knew, that slider right here. I knew Boom. what uh, one-fourth and what one-sixteenth yeah, right. looked like in any situation. So I could be in here and be like, I know where it needs to go because I've shot so many times with it. Yeah. And now I use the B1s and I know the same thing. Like I know I could guess a power right off the bat uh, just because I've shot a lot with it. never it. gets old, does it? When no. you line up a shot and you're like, that's about one one twenty five at five six. Uh, put the power and, at 3.3. <laughs> and we're, did, and you know, I shoot everything digital. I don't, I'm not a film photographer at all. I've, started when I was in college, I shot a couple film classes, but, um, you can adjust within one shot, maybe two, like you don't need much, you know, a light meter I'm sure would be really great and probably a little more exact if I learned how to use it. But, um, you can adjust so easily now. The thing, I know some photographers just swear by the light meter, Yeah. but for me, number one, light meters, they're absurdly expensive, like 250 bucks to get one of them. So that's the first thing I think I, last I looked, they were pretty expensive. I remember being that they might be more, maybe they're a little less, who cares? They're expensive, right? And it just seems like I'm adding a big step to my work. Totally, yeah. When it, like you said, I feel half the time I feel like I know I've got the 39 inch octa on there. It's about this far away from my subject. Here's what the ambient light looks like. Right. I'm gonna buckle that stand down, and I know what I'm getting. Right. And wow. every, everyone has you know different way of doing things, and some people that kind of probably speaks a lot easier and it makes the process a lot quicker. To know exactly where they, you yeah, know, that might goes. be right about but, that. You know, yeah, because and they're they're good. It's not like they're bad photographers. Like they're good, legitimately yeah. good photographers, and they swear by the light meter. Like I would teach you how to use a light meter first thing. What's his name? Who does all the Vanity Fair like photo booth stuff? Not photo booth. That's a terrible word for it. The <laughs> what's his name? Salinger. Salinger? Oh, Mar is it Mark Salinger? Mark Salinger. Yeah, I think I know. Um, who but you're he, about. he he talks. He's got about good work. Yeah, he's great yeah. work. Uh, he's very classic. Like does a ton of big work but he always uses the light meter part of me wonders too if like our generation because what you're probably about as old as i'm i'm 28 oh i'm 36 i got you oh, by okay. lots of, i figured you were in your late years. 20s well you look young thanks but i i still you're kind of in my generation right or maybe i'm in your generation i feel like there's gonna become a point when we're like 50 and 60 years old where we'll just be like yeah. back in the day we used to use light meters you already see it now like <laughs> and not even in photography just in life when people are like oh when i was a kid i was like oh, i just said that and my mom said that and my dad said that when i was young <laughs> oh no I just, the other day i had somebody ask me what a vhs was oh. and i was like what yeah. this kid he was Dude. you know he was like 19 or 20 like a VH, I kind of think he called it like a v, VCS or something. And I was like, do you mean a VHS? Well, I always, I always <laughs> kind of think about my nieces and nephews. They're growing up without, they're going to, they've had like a, a phone. CD but or a had, CD. Yeah, CD. But they've had a phone and they've had this. Yeah. My niece who's two years old knows how to do this. And they don't even give her the phone. They don't let her use anything, but they've seen, you know, everyone do this. So she gets on the phone and she just goes like that. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I had a photo shoot I was doing one time, this commercial thing. And the, thankfully it wasn't the woman I was photographing, but she was like, you could have considered her sort of the creative director. She was kind of hanging out with us for the day. She didn't work for the agency. She worked with the company whose building I was in. So she was kind of giving us access and bringing us around. And all of a sudden, like two thirds of the way through the day, she got a notification on her phone that her son, young son at home, had made a hundred dollar purchase from the app store for who knows what. Right. And for the rest of the day, my son made a hundred dollar purchase. I'm gonna smash that phone when I get home. My son, right? She was so upset. I kind of felt bad for her, but at a certain point, after like three hours of hearing about it, I'm like, yeah. all right, we got the point. You're right. gonna you're gonna break the phone. But He's gonna get grounded. It's a different world <laughs> for her. So that's like the brand new thing for her. She's like, oh no, I have to worry about that. Right. Exactly. And it's and it's her young son. I mean, he it would. He had to have been five or six years old, is my kids, guess. Do your kids swipe? Oh, yeah. I mean, anytime they can get a handle on the phone. I've got a seven-month-old son this morning, you know, laying there in bed. He's trying to grab my phone off the nightstand. I'm like, what are you doing, kid? 
And he, you know, if I give it to him, then he just takes it and he like stares at it. Yeah. He doesn't quite know what to do, but he'll just stare at it and just smile. Yeah, and I always go back and forth. My my sister and brother try to limit the screen time a ton, and it's like you kind of see why when you see a lot of which. But in the same token, they'll give them the iPad when they're flipping out. I definitely think it messes with your head. Yeah, totally. Like, but I but I honestly think TV does as well. It messes with my head, and I'm 36 years yeah. old. Yeah, well, and it's well, yeah, and, and as you get older, well, there I've seen people talk about. I think Simon Sinek does a piece on it. I don't know if it was for Ted or what, but he talks about it like, you know, we regulate drugs and alcohol. And then he starts talking about how when you're scrolling through Instagram or Facebook, it's all about the next dopamine hit. What yeah. am I going to see? That FOMO, I'm fearing yeah, yeah. missing out, right? And you're you're all, you're seeking a little bit of high every yeah. time you see something new that you hadn't seen before. And heck, I'll catch myself doing it on Twitter when I'm supposed to be working. I have to set a timer. Totally. I, have an, I have an app baked into my Google Chrome that'll just be like, wake up, wake up, you cretin. Yeah. Get back to work. And, and it's... I. I just deleted Instagram for a week and Facebook from my phone and my computer and everything. And nothing changed. It was yeah, the same day in and out, except I noticed, all I did notice was me reaching for my phone more often because I know I couldn't do any of those things. I'd be like, oh yeah, I can't look right. at those. It's bizarre yeah. though. It's it's it really, really crazy. And I, I one time like audited the time that I was spending on these different social media platforms. And you don't realize how much time you're wasting. Yeah, isn't there an app? So there, there's time. an app that kind of- uh, Oh, I'm sure. I have- I have, there's a Google Chrome extension that I use that gives me a pie chart breakdown of every website I've visited throughout the day, at the end of every day. It's Gmail and... Yeah, right, exactly. But, that, but that's good if you see that, right? Because yeah. like, I should be there 80% of my day. I, you know, when I see that like Twitter is at 7%, I'm like, man, you know, fa you, well, Facebook, I don't... I, do you I, use Gmail? Yeah. Do you use the actual interface that they've built or do you use your own? Like I a, use like the, I have interface. the business account, like G Suite or whatever, but I still use their interface. I think their interface is amazing. I always, yeah. I, and well, my... and it's like, I've tried to use Mozilla's Thunderbird, but that was like wonky feeling. Outlook's a disaster. Yeah. So I'm just like, it's, I use Google Calendar. Yeah. I use Gmail. I love Google Drive. So I just stick with, yeah, yeah I stick yeah. with, it works, wow. right? It works. And, but, but I still have, I have the, my email address at tutvid.com. Sponsored by Google. Right. Yeah, exactly. But I do wish people waste more time doing stuff like listening to this podcast or watch yeah. my videos on YouTube if you're going to waste time on social media. <laughs> That's oh, the, I, I actually think doing stuff like that, like watching tutorials and watching the learning aspect of the internet is a better use of time. Well, of not, I'm not just saying that because we're doing that now, but. And I'm not just either. I, mean, I, I, kind I, of I feel less of bad about myself when I'm doing stuff like that than when I'm well, scrolling so through find, Instagram stories. Right. So if I, if I, like if I go and watch a lighting tutorial, I'll find that I want to get up and try it. Yeah. So that to me is a whole different ball game than, oh, I just binged for three episodes of this TV show. I don't know. I don't have Netflix. I don't even have cable. Like, I don't want any of that stuff distracting me. Ooh, and yeah. quite frankly, I, I don't. Ne I love Netflix. <laughs> well, I know. I watched, I watched everybody many, does. I watch too many movies. I, I, well, I just, Netflix just surpassed, was it Netflix? I think it was Netflix just surpassed cable subscriptions in this country for the first time. Well, obviously for the first time ever. Makes sense. But it's it's on its way up. They come out with a new show like every day and they, they don't promote, they don't do anything. It's so well, weird. Well, and it's an on-demand world. I've heard though that the company is up to their eyeballs in debt. That they're, I can't imagine the production cost because they're putting on legitimate, right? like it's stuff that Showtime or HBO would do back totally. in the day. Yeah. But now Netflix. They, I think they, uh, they put out like 10, it seems like there's a new show every week, but only like one kind of sticks and like, gets to people and like it becomes some sort of narco and that's all they need like that yeah, and like right. uh, stranger things and yeah stranger uh things. what else i don't even know a bunch of other ones but yeah they've got a lot of a lot of dedicated content i remember when they first started because they used to take tv shows right or uh i mean they used to just be they used to just be used mailing movies they used to mail a dvd right. they still do always... that they just mail i have a friend i showed up to his house and he had netflix dvds i'm like do you still get mail DVDs? They're like, yeah. There's some DVDs, some movies they don't have on demand that you can you can order the DVDs. So when it first started, all it was was on demand VHS and DVDs. And they DVD would, is the original on demand. And they would mail back and forth, and you would get twenty for ten dollars yeah. a month, and just send them back. When Brilliant. You're done. Yeah. And now it's now it's streaming. Yeah, right. So they started with movies and documentaries, and then they started doing their own productions. I remember when they first kind of set up and were like, we're going to make our own show. I'm thinking, oh boy. Yeah, I know. Because you know? every time you hear a company that like we're going to go too. out and do this, Hulu did the same yeah, thing. Yeah, Hulu's doing it. YouTube's doing it with really? YouTube Red, and Amazon Prime's also doing it. If you have an Amazon Prime account, you got access to all this this whole bevy yeah, what of was stuff. The, what was that one with the? There was a couple of Amazon shows that did pretty well. Like, I don't know any okay. names. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about the shows. If I if I venture into my Amazon Prime, which I try to stay away from it, because I I'm a very like addictive personality where I feel like if Me I too. start if I start a little pattern, 
I'll do it for years without right. stopping. Even like the most mundane, dumb. That's why little I, thing. I'm a photographer because I just did it every <laughs> yeah, day. Right. I got to well, we were just talking about off camera. We were talking about your shutter counts. Oh yeah, and no. how you can go 1.1 million clicks and still be like, I still love doing this. Yeah, I have to do so it. So many clicks. <laughs> well, speaking of doing stuff, this is this is a ninth podcast recording. Each one's been about an hour. Isn't that a lucky number? Lucky number nine, right? Oh, I have no idea. Isn't every, I, feel, I feel like every number's lucky to somebody. <laughs> you know, I, I, I met this girl one time. We were having a conversation, and she, you know, it's we were like, I don't know if we were teenagers at the time. I feel like I was maybe in my 20s. And it was one of these things where it's like, how do you have a conversation with somebody? And, you know, maybe an internet article said, ask, what's your favorite number? Right. right. So she asks me, what's my favorite number? I didn't know this was coming. This was straight out of her mouth. I was like, oh, I, I mean, if I have to pick, I like I like seven for some reason, and I like the number seventeen, and she she's like looking at me like I just offended her, like I called her mom fat or something, right? And she's like, I had a friend that was killed in a car accident on July seventeenth, and I'm like, oh man, like why'd you ask the question then? Whoa, you know what I mean? That's, that's heavy. Right <laughs> we never we never talked again after yeah. this. <laughs> that's a heavy, right? Yeah, exactly. Heavy way to start. There. And I'm just kind of like, do I apologize for it? I just picked a number. You right. just asked me to pick a number. I'm not two, apologizing for, for anything. Everyone wants to know it's two. A fair number is two. This or that. It's very boring. <laughs> it works though. Yeah. This or that. Turn the camera on. Turn it off. Yeah. One or two. It's very easy. Um, so you you're doing commercial stuff. You I'm I'm kind of interested in digging more into like what does your family think about what you're doing? You do, you don't come from a family of photographers, do you? No. Um, my sister is a landscape designer, so she's a, she kind of grew up in the art world. Um, my brother's a musician. By landscape designer, like she's designing golf courses. No, stuff like that. she does like um, she's pretty incredible with her work. It's more like um, sustainable. Uh, I guess it's more residential, but she has done some bigger. Play, but it's like sustainable landscape design. So she designs like for my house, she's going to help us kind of integrate different aspects of like compost and our gardens and um, our chickens into this kind of like, what's it like? These are flowers, but come pick in time you can eat them. Right. But yeah. she's just really smart at like, she knows she's, she's yeah, she has a, she's she has a she brain does. for it. Yeah. Anyways, but no, my mom and dad were not artists, um, but they let us do whatever we wanted because they were the best. So. Your bro- does your brother do photography? No, your he's twin brother. He's a, yeah. He's a musician and he is a music teacher now. Gotcha. Uh, he plays everything under the sun. Uh, and is teaches middle school. He just got a new job last year. I think it's middle school. Uh, so he teaches that, and uh, yeah, that's oh. what he does. But no, they yeah, everyone loves. I mean, I they got a built-in family photographer, so yeah, I'm right. always you know, especially with my nieces and nephews, I'm always the carrying the, the camera. Year. I mean, that's how I started too. When Bring I got, the camera, Justin. Right. They try not to do that anymore because they know it kind of annoys me sometimes. It doesn't annoy me. I actually do it without asking most of the time. But my sister especially was like. Let them relax without a camera for a little. <laughs> uh, but they'll always be like, oh, I want to pick up a camera for this. How many nieces and nephews do you have? I have three. My brother has three gals, and my sister has a daughter and a son, so that's uh, five total. Five yeah. total. And they all, they all like Uncle Justin? Yeah, it's the best. I have <laughs> no kids myself. So I was going to say, being the uncle with no kids gives you the uh, flexibility to still be the fun uncle, it's right? It's the best. <laughs> and uh, But they all live, my sister lives in Cold Spring, New York, and my brother lives in Rhode Island, so I don't get to see him very often. Okay. I'm actually going this weekend to see them uh, in Cold Spring, but uh, yeah, it's so fun hanging out, and I love taking pictures of them. Actually, I posted. I always Post make portraits of stuff. yeah, make portraits of everything I, I come in contact with, like chickens, my dog, dog yeah. uh, and my nieces. <laughs> uh, tell me more about these chicken portraits because I saw them. Um, I saw them. I haven't seen one in a little bit, but you were going through a phase where you were posting them pretty well, regularly. Well, we we did. My wife, we got chickens uh, probably like six months ago at this point, and she wanted to take one a week just to see them grow. Okay. And I was like, I'm not setting up this once a week to take pictures of chickens. <laughs> so we just take natural light ones and it was fun. And then once I was like, all right, we'll do a real setup. So I brought them, did, you know, put it in the garage. And at that time we were also making our Christmas card, which had to do with chickens. Was that the one, the chicken pool and the yeah, sleigh? Yeah, yeah. Cause so every was, year you guys do this, some crazy <laughs> Christmas card, yeah. right? That's why I have that lamp right there. Going, um, going back to yeah. going back to, I don't know what year. Uh, we do, This is year seven, I believe. No, six. Okay. It was just ever since you've known her, you, yeah. you've been doing one every year. Yeah, yeah. 2011, I think, was the first one. Um, so, where were we? Chicken portraits. Oh, yeah. So, we just, I wanted to do portraits, and I didn't, I lit them the same way I lit people. So, I didn't want to make them any, any different. I wanted to make them the way I do people, and 
Did they complain? That's not my good side. So Veronica, was, my wife is like the chicken whisperer. So she was able to like, I couldn't, I can't deal with them. She's good with them. Uh, and I only, I could only maybe get like three or four shots before they would run off camera or at jump. me or jump or. Did you put them up on a perch or on a table? Yeah. So we had a, like basically a table like right here and I put a piece of wood cause they like to like, yeah, grab, grab onto something. Grab around, something uh, so that made them stay a little longer and it gave me a good platform to kind of raise them up and shoot. And what's the lighting setup like? Cause normally like. A, like skin's going to reflect the light a little, yeah. especially us paler complexion folk. Yeah, pale skin's terrible. <laughs> That's why I photograph terribly. <laughs> um, uh, but chickens generally are pretty dark, and it, to me, they they look and feel like something that would be a sponge for light. Yeah, they. The, the, I just use two giant. I use my biggest modifiers. I, That's what I use for most portraits. And uh, one fill, one shape, and that's it. That's all I did. Nothing. So it's a three crazy. three light setup. No, two, just two. two. Yeah, okay. just kind of. Oh, in terms of shape, you're flagging the opposite Yeah, I mean, one just then. always, 40, not always, but 45 degree kind of shaping them. And it really depended on them because humans, they have a face that kind of, you can right. make them. So Call this them one, I was scale. kind of like at the mercy of whichever yeah. way they wanted to turn. So, so once in a while I got lucky and they looked, you know, right statuesque and sometimes they look terrible. You can't hold up like a little fleck of corn no, or something. They, them they don't, they don't, if <laughs> they do, they'll just jump at it. Oh, and yeah, now our rooster is right. pretty angry. So he like attacks people, not attacks people, he attacks me, only me. It doesn't attack my wife. Um, so She's the chicken whisperer. She so of course is. So she was like, we have to take porches because they're fully grown now. And I'm like, he's just going to like run after me because he hates me. But Shoot. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of cool. So when it comes time to edit your photos, are you editing a lot in Photoshop, Lightroom? Do you have a preference? Uh, if I do batch stuff, uh, if I, like, I still shoot weddings from time to time and I will use Lightroom only. Didn't you used to have a wedding... Photography company? I still do, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm const the constant trying to transition completely, but, you right. know. Right, so you're still fading. You're in yeah. a little bit of the crossfade between the two genres. Totally, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I mean, okay. well, that actually helps with, and I, I was talking about this with an uh, assistant of mine, that it really has helped me understand light way better shooting weddings because yeah. you're kind of thrown into these situations where like you have 10 minutes to figure out what to shoot, where to shoot it, and what looks the best. And no time for any kind of crazy. No, I don't bring anything. Stuff. I don't bring any flags, bounces, lights, anything. Do you like speed lights? Nothing. Wow, so you're doing all... Yeah, all natural, every... all. I mean, at night, I'll throw a speed light on. But I, I first discovered your work through an engagement shoot. I think it was an engagement shoot. Maybe it was just a couple shoot for Tim and Melissa. I oh, yeah, yeah. Her name. Totally. I don't think they're still I used together. To work with, I used to work with Tim. Right. That's yeah. what I th Okay, that's, I thought that's how you met him. Yep. And the shot that was like, I like this guy's work. Oh, I did. I did. So was, back then, I did use... Uh, Flash. Oh, you were using a flash launch? Yeah, okay. back then. Because you did this shot like through, I looked like it was a corner building with oh, yeah, glass yeah. windows. Oh, so that one wasn't lit, but yes. That I was that was the photo that I was like, I like I liked this guy's work. That was, yeah, that was. I don't know who he is, <laughs> but I like what I'm seeing. Uh, so I used to try to implement that because I was obsessed with lighting. So I was like, oh, I have all these people who want me to take their picture. I'll bring light. But it's too cumbersome. And like with people who aren't used to being in front of a camera, you're spending more time getting them comfortable. Yeah. And you need that connection. Yeah. You need the, that's way more important than a, uh, to me than a, especially for that type of photography, than the beautifully lit. So yeah. you're forced to find the beautifully lit. So you, mm. you're constantly looking for that light. So when I do the portraits now, where I'm like, all right, I'm, I, this portrait would, would be perfect if there was a kick of light right here. Mm. That's what I add now. So understanding that and then even with the editorial we are like put into a situation where we're like all right we have this this and this go and you can kind of like assess the situation a lot quicker than if i didn't do wedding photography i wouldn't be able yeah. to see it as well maybe. yeah and i've never really had a client come back to me and say i would have liked the picture if you'd used the big octa right, here yeah, yeah, instead yeah. of the medium sized yeah. one yeah very disappointed in you so but they, i think they definitely feed within each other but i don't ever bring lights out for weddings that's gotcha i don't even okay. remember what was the original question i forget what it was uh, if you're still doing oh, Lightroom, no Lightroom. Oh, yeah. Lightroom versus Photoshop. Yeah, we just kind of <laughs> yeah, spiral off in anywhere. Uh, yeah. So when do you use Photoshop? All oh, you do composite stuff. Yeah, once in a while. Once I, in a I while. never get paid for composite stuff. Like no one like wants me to like that's really. Not what, no. I get a lot of requests for composite work. No one. I've never gotten hired for a composite job. Wow. Uh, I, oh, no, I Your composites are pretty legit. Yeah, I just think it's a tougher like. I don't know. Maybe I just, I'm not good at marketing. I'm not good at marketing in general, but <laughs> I'm less, you know, I'm more inclined to show the, the that type of portraiture, just the simple kind of environmental that's straight up than the, the composite ones. Do you, have you ever worked with an agency or somebody that would represent you and be like, no, hire my dude, Justin? I've had some people uh, like want to work, but not in the capacity that I would want to work with them. Yeah. Uh, so nothing's ever kind of come, come to fruition. Um, and you always get a lot of the, kind of bigger, I don't know what they're called, like 
agency access and and there's a bunch of different ones that I'll get emails from every once in a while to like join their kind of group. But it's yeah. like, it's more of like a giant thing that I feel like it's weird when an agency is trying to get you to join. Yeah. Like so kind of but they're not bad if you use them for you and you don't expect anything from them. Uh, so if you just go into it being like, all right, I'm going to utilize what they give me, which I don't still, cause I'm terrible at marketing as we've said <laughs> before, then it's actually really but good. But that's where an agency that handles a lot more of your marketing and gives you consultation and stuff like yeah. that, I feel like it would be perfect for totally. somebody like I, that. I, yeah. Because you can deliver the goods right. on the back end. Get me on set. Give I, me the job that's, brief. That's what I always say. And always let say. me I'm shoot. Like, I, can, I can shoot it. Just let me do it. It's right. Tough. I mean, there's a lot of photographers out there. There's a lot of work. But and having that person to do the sales for you and, and take your brand and everything you have and push it. 2018 is marketing year for me, so I, I'm well, making... four months in, so get yeah, to work. I know. Well, because up until this point, I've never had to, in a good way, like work has always steadily yeah. come in and like I've Word gotten good mouth, jobs. And different right. connections, networking. But the level of jobs, is that doesn't happen that way. Like you, I mean, yeah, it does, it does I, for some I feel people. like you should be making uh, like 15,000 a day that you show up to shoot a job. That's where I would. Do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> twice a year. Would you take it? <laughs> um, I just, I, that's where I, that's, I mean, because you're like, you have the skills. You get those jobs very infrequently, but um, they're not a lot out there. And especially like, I'm still kind of caught in a regional world, which is great. I get a lot of great jobs, but regional stuff is not that caliber. And breaking into when you do, um, more national work, you're vying against national York, LA, LA. Man, well, Chicago. everybody. I mean, every place has a Philly that has budding photographers that are doing really great work. Yeah. Every city that's slightly major of Austin, you know, Dallas, any place has yeah. great photographers. Seattle, Seattle, right. right. I just did a, uh, I was just there for a um, yeah, photo were, workshop. Yeah, I saw you posting a lot of photos. From, I yeah. didn't know if the cabin you were taking pictures of was your cabin or a postcard you had no, bought. No, no, so that was the two different things. We went. I was kind of like whenever I go out for like a job or like this was a workshop, uh, I we extend it for vacation. So my wife and I just went and some friends went to Washington for just to look at the national parks. So that's that's what that was. But then I did a workshop with John Keatley, the yeah. the uh, portrait I know, photographer. I know John is. I don't know him personally, but right. I know who he is. Good um, photographer. Yeah, and we it was more business related because that's what I'm terrible at. Um, did he try to sell you a light meter? No, no. We <laughs> like we talked. There was a little bit about technique as far as like looking at my work, but not okay. nothing. He didn't say like this is how to light a portrait. So I, he did he do a portfolio review? Uh, of sorts. It was mainly it. it was mainly to kind of like understand how what my work was like, not to like oh this oh, is okay. wrong, this is what you need to change. It was more gotcha. Uh, at least for me, I'm not sure if everyone's experience was the same, but it's more of I just have to figure out how, who you are as a photographer, so okay. I can kind of right on you know okay. talk intelligently to you. So what was the workshop? You said it was more business oriented. Yeah, it was just about how like a little bit about marketing and a little bit about uh, approaching clients and getting clients and keeping clients and conversating and, uh, you know, everything to go in, everything that's not technical photography talk. So I don't really care for workshops in that realm because I feel like you can learn it yourself and like there's a billion videos on YouTube that if you don't know how to do something, I guarantee it's on YouTube. There's so many photo workshops that I've been to where the technique has been like big soft box on the side, yeah. silver reflector on the other side, muslin puke stained background behind them. <laughs> Hair light with a gridded right. strip back, yeah. and that's it. I did. I did one. Uh, I did like a quick um, portrait workshop in the studio o over the winter, and I was trying to get to beginner beginners to show them how to like how a light literally works, which I think is useful to see someone do it in person because I learned all that stuff myself, and I could have skipped two months, three months if someone had just shown me how to do it. Mm -hmm. So that stuff where you tell them this is beginner, I'm not going to tell you how to shoot. I'm going to show you the tools and go forward. And even that, I've, I, I don't love doing it. I don't. I feel like there's too many. Like, no offense, you, you do a great job, but there's a lot of tutorials out there. So, like, very offended. I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be. You know, I'm not good at that. You're good at it. You're good on camera. You're good talking to people. I am not. But as, you still, as you can even, see, it doesn't. <laughs> like, I've always looked at it like it doesn't matter if there's ten people that have done a video on a particular topic. Right. I've never done a video totally. on yeah, that yeah. particular topic. It's a good way to think about it. And there's there's still stuff about your work where on a national level. I'll put it to you this way. I've had people tell me that there, there are certain photographers online who either blog about stuff or put stuff on YouTube or whatever, where they go and they look at their personal work. And because of the personal work, they're kind of like, ah, do I really trust this guy? Yeah. Right? I don't think you're going to have that problem. If you, and I'm not saying you should go out and start a YouTube channel tomorrow. Right, no. In fact, don't because you're just going <laughs> to compete against me. But I, I feel like there's, there's still room for any kind of it. Like you should be on Creative Live. 
That's I, that's the kind of setup. It's funny because John was on Creative Live the week after he did our thing. Um, but that's where we did the workshop. Was at Creative Live. Okay. Um, anyways, I always have. I I think most artists or photographers or whatever medium you, you choose struggle with. You're either one. You're either able to kind of give up yourself and give up what you do and talk freely about it and not feel. Uh, self-conscious about it or you're not and I'm in the not category where not that I feel self-conscious I'm very proud of my work I understand what I like to do I know I'm good at what I like to do um, but I have a hard time putting it out there for people to I, don't, I, I understand exactly what you're talking yeah, about yeah and I think most people it's a very common thing it's not like yeah. I'm uh, it's not, I'm not afraid unique. of what people will think about it I just, totally. I just like I just never get around to doing it yeah it's it's not even that either like I don't you know like I'm like I said very proud of it like Having, um, I don't know what the word is, just like being able to put yourself out there in a very honest way is, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a bunch of people that do it really well. We were talking about this earlier that seem very fluid and very honest and not in a pretentious way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what I'm always scared of, being, being yeah, a little pretentious. Because pretentious, yeah. the pretentious thing will turn people off fast. Well, it doesn't, I actually, because you notice a lot of people who just commit and don't care. Well, yeah, I guess you're right. Like, yeah, you're right. There are, there are definitely people that are pretty pretentious. That, that just do that, it. Yeah. They and, just, and they get, that's and kind of the internet now. And, it's just like, if you're, yeah. if you're willing to just put yourself well, out it's there. it's the internet now, but it's going to be the internet in five years. Uh, I don't know. I feel like it'll kind of. Um, and it's not a bad thing if that's, you know, I, I, like I said, I it think that it's, a, it's an art in itself. If you're able to just like <laughs> throw yourself out there and say this and this, but there is a lot of false information, uh, photography wise and like what people are teaching that you're like, I feel like people should try to learn their own way of doing that. Uh, cause finding your style is kind of like the most important thing and yeah. understanding what you like. And if you just, although I do say to everyone who asks, how do I start? I'm like, Look at other photographers and copy them right away. Like, yeah, oh, so if, exactly. Yeah, like exactly the same thing I tell. If you, you like something and you don't know what to do, try to do that, and yeah, then eventually you're, you're not going to do it. And then, <laughs> and then eventually you'll be like, like I don't really reference a lot of photos anymore. I kind of try to think of things on my own. But when I first started, I'd be like, this is awesome. I'm yeah, gonna try to do that. Yeah, and now I have come to a point where I'm a little more comfortable. Well, and it's funny because in trying to chase these people who you really like. Mm -hmm. Joey L was always a photographer I really liked. I like Dean Bradshaw, Dave mm -hmm. Hill. Those are guys that when I was first getting started, I'm like, whoa, I right. love what these guys are doing. And I still love a lot of what they're doing. Jeremy Coward, he's another guy. I love Zach Arias. Um, you know, different people like that. And you, just named, you, you named the big hitters on the internet. Yeah, pretty they're, much. They're out there. Well, I'm, look, I'm a geek. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm an internet guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and uh, I would find myself, I would take this photo or that photo and I would break it down, all right? They probably lit it this way and that way and then I would go try to like copy the exact same photo. Yeah. You know, jump onto Craigslist or Model Mayhem back in the day. I don't know what that, I don't know what that yeah. swamp has turned into. Um, but uh, I'd go try to find, like he used a blonde haired girl. I go see if I could find a blonde haired girl who needed some photos in her portfolio. Let's make a deal. Right. You know, a lot of TF stuff, a lot of test stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know, I would just say, hey look, I'm gonna shoot for this. Is there anything you want out of the shoot? We can try to shoot for that as well. Right. And, and what would happen was I never managed to copy a single photo. I did 120 shoots my first year. Oh, wow. 100 test shoots. Test shoots. They were all test shoots. Busy man. It was like, yeah, one every two days or one every two and a half days. It was crazy average, right? Unsustainable. <laughs> but I also had nothing else going on. Right. Because I was still doing my tut vid stuff and that I was making money doing that. And it was like, I want to learn how to do this photography thing. I yeah. want to learn how light works, how the camera works. And also, you know, you ever sit there with the camera in your hand? Like, I feel like I could spin the camera around my hand yeah. half the time. Like, it's an extension of my hand. I think that's why I don't ever re go away from Canons because I'm just so, I don't, I don't think about yeah, it anymore. Yeah, it's like Eric Clapton and his guitar. It's just like an extension. It's bold. Of, it's very bold. Yeah, but no, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying <laughs> know, for, for any photographer that yeah, uses yeah. it for a while. Total. You know what I mean? It just, it feels like you could, like somebody I, could blindfold you can just be like, here's how to change the ISO. Boom, I just changed from 1600 to 64. Yeah. I'm good to go. I think si since, um, since college and even when I was uh, uh, in the band and then um, as an art director, I was always project oriented. So like I would always work on projects and I would always bring projects to fruition and figure out how to get this one thing out. And I still do that now. I basically, my life is projects. It's like figuring out this one thing. It's the best way to get stuff done. Too, right. right. So like, and I always try to make things on bigger s you know, scopes so I can, especially pro personal projects. I don't do as many anymore. I'm trying to do a lot more so I can you know, show what I want to show, but, sure. um, just thinking in project terms and like something to, you know, s since college based, that's all I did. And so now I just kind of continue that. Were you pretty self-conscious about your work coming out of school? Um, no, my, I'm, I'm not a very self-conscious person aside from when I'm on video. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've always been relatively like, okay with what I, I mean, I, 
I think like everybody, you, you always think your work can get better. And I definitely do. I'm still like, I actually was talking to someone here this morning and saying the same thing. It was like, I'm you know surprised you, you don't get out there more with different companies. I'm like, um, I haven't done any marketing because I still don't think I'm ready to show. And I always say that. And I think I'll always say that. So I'm, that's why I'm this year. Yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to start showing. And yeah, start putting stuff yeah, hundred percent. Because otherwise, it's gonna be like, well, Justin died, never <laughs> yeah. quite ready to show. <laughs> shows, I, have a, I have a book on my shelf called "Show Your Work," uh, and I, I show that means beyond social media, which is easy. I can yeah. press a button; it's out there. But like trying to make relationships with different. We were just. I just did an interview for uh, Bill Kramer. He's he was on the podcast. He runs a Wonderful Machine, which is like a production company, and they have all these great photographers and whatnot. Um, he was telling me one of the things that they do off interview, he was telling me about, he was kind of giving me a, a tour of the place a little bit. A little, little um, inside scoop. They yeah, get a lot of cool stuff going on over there. But he, um, he was saying that one of the things they'll do is they go into some of these bigger companies and firms and, you know, ad agencies, marketing firms, PR places, I guess all these different places. I mean, he didn't, he didn't explicitly name them all to me, but I'm just, I'm filling in the details here. And they take a bunch of the physical portfolios they have on the shelf for their photographers that, that they're representing, and they go and they say, hey, we're going to come and give you a little medley of the, the tasty taste that you can get if you work. You know, and maybe 18 to the 20 portfolios we bring we don't work for any of your clients. Right. But there's two there that do. Yeah, yeah. And now we have a connection with this agency. Totally. And that's, a, that's kind of, you know, I don't know. I've never thought about doing that, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I... I, you know, I, I mean, I've tried to approach companies on my own, just yeah. being like a bullheaded, stubborn SOB kind yeah. of thing. And sometimes it works. Yeah. Sometimes you get shut down. Yeah. You know, like I approached the Most band, the, down, the Fray, like years ago about about doing like some tour photography for him. And their manager was nice, responded to me, and he's kind of like, "Kid, you're a little bit too, you know, like you need to yeah. you need to work on them skills a little bit." Right. Which you know, now looking back, five years after I reached out, they were absolutely right. Yeah. It was pretty awful. Oh, there's yeah. the hindsight is always fun to yeah. look back. <laughs> wow. So I was like. Yeah. I definitely should not have done that. <laughs> so when you were um, when you were doing your music, you yeah. were in a band and all that. You were telling me just before off camera, you got photographed by Joey L. I did, Joey yes. Lawrence. Before you ever were into didn't, photography, yes, didn't know who he was. Who he his birthday's didn't. five days or something. I'm pretty sure his birthday's November fifth. Mine's November eleventh. Yeah. He's literally like six, five or six days older than me. Yeah, no, didn't. I mean, uh, yeah, didn't care or understand who he was. Not that I, you know, but like. Looking did you guys hire it, him? How did that? Our record label did. Okay. Oh, uh, we we had a hand in it. Like we went through a handful of photographers and we we're like, oh, we love this guy's work. Let's work with him. Reach out to him, see if he works. And then, so the label gave you a choice of several photographers. Is that yeah. Kind of how it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, okay. I mean, we were kind of noobs with everything, and we didn't really know like. Right. We but still in interesting to think about from a photography standpoint, because Joey was either working with somebody or just himself approached these agents. The, these yeah. Labels. I, I mean, we had, I think we had right after we worked with them almost like not right after, but close to after he did the twilight stuff. And that's what they right. referenced the entire time. So like, oh yeah, the guy that did the twilight stuff, um, which now I don't even know if I, I doubt it's even in his portfolio, but, um, mm. uh, that's how they referenced him. And, that's not what we were drawn to. We saw his other stuff. We're like, oh, this is. I was gonna say, yeah, were you guys going for the Twilight look? Yeah, no. The well, twink. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really great work. And then we did a full day of shoot. Um, I still have the the contact sheets for everything. And you yeah. know, looking back on it, it was a really fun. That's just, I didn't. I, I, I wish it would. Knowing like being a photographer now, I didn't pay attention to anything. So I, yeah. you know, you're just there getting photographed, and you're like, all right, cool. The thing all that a lot of Joey L and Annie Leibovitz work always like. It seems like every behind the scenes photo I've ever seen, and maybe not all of them, but every one that I can remember seeing, there's always two CTO gelled beauty dishes as backlights. I couldn't even tell you. Oh, there was for that one too, actually. Yeah. No, for <laughs> I just, I always, I, that's the thing that always, almost every behind the scenes shot I see for either of them, hmm. I always see that. <laughs> yeah, uh, he did. Yeah, our individual portraits. That that's what he did. Okay. Yeah, I believe it. I mean, I believe it because yeah. it's just. It, I always see it. I always see it. They. That was the first. They made us wear makeup. That was the first time I ever wore makeup. Uh, they. I was like, I don't think we need this. They're like, you need it. I was like, all right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So, how many? If you don't mind me asking, how many jobs are you doing a month on average? Like, are you staying pretty busy? Yeah. I mean, um, this this winter was slow uh, by design. And then I got I get antsy when it's slow, um, and now it's picking back up. Um, but January, February, I try to like relax a little. We usually go away, but we just bought a house, and we spend time doing that instead yeah, of going care away. Of the yeah, and now dogs. She <laughs> over there? I don't know. I don't know where she went. She's over there. Oh yeah. Um, and 
So yeah, uh, a month, it's, it varies. It could be 10, it could be two. Um, the goal is less for more, like every photographer, a little bit more yeah. thoughtful process, but yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying, one $10,000 client. So right, 10, well, it's just like when you can clients. focus, I hardly ever get to focus all of my energy on one thing, yeah. which is unfortunate. I mean, it's a blessing and a curse, but like I'd like a time where you're like, all right, I'm narrowed in on this one thing. I'm going to make this thing the great. Not to say that every project that comes up, I don't give it its own thought, but in a given day, if it's a small project, there's a million other small projects happening. And that's kind yeah. of how it works for every industry. So when you, did you approach Philly Magazine? How did you get them as a client? Yeah, they, that, I just sent them my portfolio a long time ago. This is probably like, I think my first job was with them 2014 or 15. Mm. I don't remember. Um, but Back then, they had a different photo editor, and I just sent her my work and was like, hey, I'd love to come show you my book. And I made a meeting with her, showed her my book, and she's like, keep you in mind. And then a month later, she reached out. Wow. That's or maybe great. more than a month later. But it was because of a specific, like, the whole point is, like, at least what I've found and when I get hired is, like, you need an image that they can respond to. Like, if they don't see something in your portfolio that they want, they're not going to hire you. They're not going right. to, I'm not going to get hired for food photography, although I have, but on a bigger scale because I don't show food photography and I probably could shoot it, but I don't show it. So someone's not going to be like, I trust you. I think you can do this. Right. So she showed me, I can't remember the shot that she showed me of mine, but she was like, we like this. This is kind of what we're going for, for this project. Can you, are, are you available? Do something simple. Yeah. And I was obviously, yes, I'm very interested. And then built a relationship with the, the whole team there. And you know, they have a lot of, there's a lot of good Philly photographers. So they have a lot of like people to pick from and, yeah. Uh, I think they do a good job of kind of spreading the, the good work. So it's not always the same people or the same person. Uh, and, you know, they still hire me. So I like it. So Philly Magazine, local magazine, you reached out yourself. Yep. You didn't but need it, an agent to do that. But so that, that's how it kind of always works. It's not always that smooth. Like I've got, right, I've got, course, I've got meetings course. that nothing pans out. Right. I've got yeah. No but we don't, we, as, as an optimistic person, yeah. that stuff never happened. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's just, it's only the stuff that worked out. So up until that point, that's what I was like. I never planned stuff. I would just do stuff and things would happen to work out. Now I'm to the point where like, you're looking to strategize and it's not working out. So I'm like, Oh, this is, this is, it's It's tough, man. I know what you're saying. It's It's tough. It's, I found it's a volume issue. You know, Napoleon said there's a quality in quantity, like quantity has a quality all of its own. Yeah. Yeah. Of course he was speaking of artillery, which, okay. That (laughs) makes sense. But I just find like, I don't want to do that with my photos. Like, I don't want to just be like, I'm just going to spray and pray yeah, and yeah. run into a good image. Or well, something. that's why I've really tried to like, before I would send stuff to a lot of people and I'm trying to focus, like make very tangible, you know, I want to be able to sit down with these five people by the end of the year. I'm going to see if I can make this work and try not to annoy them in the process. Yeah. I sometimes try to annoy them. The yeah. I always, and that's another thing, like figuring out your voice when you talk to these people. Are you going to be passive or are you going to be aggressive or are you going to be complete yourself? Or, you, you know, are you just going to show your work? Are you going to try to be, you know, there's all these questions and no one has the right answer because it's different for everybody. So you have to find it yourself and it's always hard to find that. Like, so this year is your year of marketing. So 2018 is the year of the marketing. Yeah, I said a little bit of that last year. I say a lot of things every year and then don't do it because I, I, I get too do the busy. Same thing. Yeah, like, I mean, this every, is going to be the week I do this. Yeah, and then a week later, no, this right. is going to be the week. But <laughs> you know, I want to be at a spot where I think I should be for me to be happier, not happier, but more fulfilled in the yeah. work. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, that's the way to do it. Uh, not just waiting for stuff to come. Yeah, that's so. the word. I hate. I hate that feeling. Yeah, I would. I've always been the kind of guy who I would rather have a little bit less, but know I can count on it, than yeah. be waiting for the big boomer bust and always living like I'm on a right. roller coaster. Yeah, and you know, I. And the I, ideal is establish the smoothness and then still get the boomer bust. I'm, I'm just you know you know still taking a lot of jobs that I shouldn't be taking, and that was something I. So, you know, you're, you know, you shouldn't be doing certain things and should be doing, and you just don't or do, you know, like I should be taking less of these jobs that aren't fulfilling. They don't go to my, uh, 90% of the stuff I shoot don't, doesn't show up anywhere. So I, I understand what you're saying. And when I, so when I'm approached with a job like that, I just, I do it at a price that makes sense for me. Yeah. And, and it, the nice thing about it is I'm very free and carefree, if you will. Yeah. When it comes to the negotiation, totally, it's yeah. like, here's the if money. You don't really if you can it. make it work, totally. I'll be more than happy to do it, but I really can't do it for less because it's not really a project. You know, I don't tell them it's not a project. I'm not. This goes back to, to me it. being a terrible business person as well. That not also my bad at marketing, bad at business. So I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at negotiating. I'm terrible at like 
doing all that. And I'm getting better at it. And I understand where I need to be and what I need to do. It's just doing it is always the problem. It's, well, once you saying once no, saying no has been an issue for me. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I feel I feel you there. Yeah. I, I I understand that. I I when I was younger, I remember I would what would be difficult for me would be quoting a price that was actually the price that I thought I should totally. get. Totally. And I would do things like cut it in half. The amount of times I get my full creative fee is very. Is very that of your own doing or because they're negotiating with you though? Uh, both. Both. Yeah, a lot of times I'll take I'll, I'll, I'll like take the client into into account and I'll be like. They're not going to Do you do usually this. negotiate via email or over the yeah, phone? Yeah, email. Yeah, see, that's the problem. Yeah. It's a whole different... When you're doing a face-to-face, because what I usually... What I like to do is if you can negotiate via... Nego- the problem with negotiating via email is you can quote a price and the person never has to respond. Right, yeah. Right? And that's the scary thing. Yeah. But if you get them on the phone and you say, hey, it's going to be $6,500 to do the shoot, you can hear the... Ugh, in their voice, totally. right? Right. And then you can follow up with the... Do you have a budget? Right. Well, yeah. And, and, and here's, here's well, the Well, I usually, actually, I usually start with that. I was like, what's your budget? And if they come back with a ridiculous number, I'm like, well, this is my day rate. I can, or my creative rate, and I can do this, you know, I could come down for this or whatever, you know, right. then we'll I'll see make. see what we can do with For this. So, needs. you know, but I, I also hate doing that because then you're a work for hire and you're not being hired for your yeah, work. for what you're doing. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, no, I, I, I feel you. Instead of like. I enjoy the, the people that come to me for something that I can do for them rather than something anyone can do for them. Yeah, of um, course. For, you know, that, which is not Anybody a bad... Anybody can blast a but, ring light in your face. Right, right but it's not want. a bad way to get into photography because you'll figure stuff out for yeah, bad and, jobs. And, and you, need the, you need to... I think it was Douglas Saunders who I was talking to one time, commercial photographer, pretty good photographer, shoots phase one, he's got some cool gear um, and some cool cars too. He's a big, big car guy. Uh, but... He was telling me, and it was the first time I ever heard anybody say this, which maybe goes to show how young I am or was in the industry when he said this to me. But he was saying, I sh- like maybe like 50% of the work I shoot is so I can shoot the other 50% yeah, of stuff totally. that I want to shoot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, the same thing when I worked at QVC. I worked at QVC so I could go to a different thing later right. on. That's... Oh, so QVC was not your dream. Like, oh, this no. is the pinnacle of yeah. where my photography <laughs> no. will be. Well, I didn't QVC do, I didn't do photography there. I did. Oh, I was the direction, the art, art right? direction. Um, yeah. No, that was just like, I didn't know where I wanted to go. And that was eventually, you know, I guess I didn't start, obviously didn't start the job thinking, all right, I'm going to be gone in three years. I started loving it and thinking it was going to be a great job. And then when starting into photography, it was a means to buy the equipment and work on my own. These 5D Mark III's don't buy themselves. Right, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And figure out how to use the equipment and, you know, buy a light and figure out what a light does and all that stuff. So, yeah. Well, getting back to the negotiation thing, one thing that I realized is I used to do this thing where I would slash my own price preemptively. The yeah. client wouldn't even say, yeah, I know, yeah. I, I don't have that much money. Yeah. And there was there was one time, and this changed the way that I negotiated, aside from some negotiating books and things that I've read since then. But there was one time where I had a job and I was gonna quote him a thousand bucks for the shoot. It was like, a, I think it was a day and a half project, but there's post-production involved. There's right. a lot of things going on. And I said, you know what? You, you don't need this money to pay your bills. Mm-hmm. This feels like a $6,800 job. I, I think I quoted him $6,880, right? I'd, I'd like $6,880 to do this. Here's what I'll deliver. Here's how quickly I can do it. Let me know when you need it. Mm-hmm. This, that, and the other. We're on the phone talking. And they come back to me right away, and they're like, ah, our budget's like 50 I think it was 5300 Can you do it for 5300 And of course I accept it. Yeah. Because then in my mind, I'm thinking, I was just ready to do this for 1000 bucks. Right. Right. And, and it would have been like, I would, you know, I got to drive to and from this place. Yeah. And because see, for me, I was always like, if it takes me three days to retouch, so what? Right. right. But then it's like, I do need to get paid for those days as well. I'm totally. using my equipment. I'm wearing my computers down. I'm storing the images on my, my yeah, storage dude, devices. I, and it's the time factor. I'm, it changed everything. Yeah. But also negotiating on the phone or face to face. Right. Game change. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Game I'm change. still terrible at that. Every year I say I'm going to get better. And I don't. But actually, even um, today or yesterday, I'm putting an electric fence in with for my dog so they can run. We have a pretty big yard, but they run away. So <laughs> we're going to do that. And the lady came and she quoted us a price. And we talked the whole thing. And then without even saying anything, she was like, I maybe could feel that I was like hesitant because it was expensive. She was like, oh, I can knock $200 off. I was like, oh, all right. Yeah. And I wasn't even so going to ask her. response should have been... Can you knock three? Yeah, I know, off, and I did. Right? I did, that's, and I should That's have. the play, <laughs> and then, and then, and, and you know, you don't want to beat anyone up too much, but it's if they're willing to give, there's they've still got more to give. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, yeah. You got to get to the point where people say no. That's right. the key in negotiation. And the problem is via email, 
no is usually the end of the conversation. Yeah, I, no is the beginning of the negotiation, though. Looking, looking, you know, looking at my calendar for the next two months, I'm still doing jobs that are just like they're jobs, which yeah. is not a bad thing. I yeah, no, I, I, I understand you know, exactly what you're saying. And I'm happy, I'd rather have it than not. Totally, yeah. But I also I've got more steps that I'm looking right. to take. Yeah, so yeah. it's a balance trying to trying to get there. I'm eyeing up your iMac back here. Oh, it's not mine. Oh, Mine's okay. my. That's uh my. So I have a couple of people that working here with me okay. and that's his oh i was going to comment i appreciate the fact that you have some kind of sticker over the camera no especially oh. in light of all this facebook stuff that's we're, going on we're moving studios and my all my all my computer equipment's at oh, my office gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. all right well that kind of kills it. all right we're okay. wrapping this thing up okay um i like to ask all of my guests before we uh, before we wrap this thing up do you have any irrational fears phobias things you're terrified of mm -hmm. things that make your hair stand up on end things i'm that very claustrophobic very claustrophobic. Very, like, Do you have any stories of being claustrophobic when you freak out? I can't take out? I can't take elevators to places. Really? It's like with it, all your gear. I do. Now I know I get, why you have a system. But I get very nervous. <laughs> you uh, get shaky. It's ter it's gotten to a point. It's, it's stupid. I like have dreams about it. It's terrible. But I will like if These I can. Are the kind of phobias I like. The more irrational, if, if the better. I can, and I know it is. And tell I, me if, more. But if I can avoid being in an elevator, I will. I there was only one time where I got kind of stuck. I didn't even really get stuck, but I like almost had a panic attack. <laughs> and I'm, I don't have any other fears of anything like heights. So I you wouldn't be going to the top of the Empire State Building anytime soon. No, um, I guess if it's a nice big open cool like, and I, I always look for a door up top. If there's like the door that you can punt you know like open up there's not always that in elevators so then i'm like okay i can at least i feel like that's there. the worst place to be in an elevator no, imagine well, being in an elevator shaft to the 80th floor on the empire state building well at least it's if, open if you <laughs> get on top is. of that elevator and the piston or the cable or however it works gives out you're going 80 stories and instead of being in this solid yeah, steel, I guess you're, you're right. probably dead well it's way. not about falling that, <laughs> i'm not worried about falling i'm worried about being just closed in, close. in oh yeah i guess uh, okay that makes sense we were in uh, so you'd rather ride on top of the elevator yeah we went to new zealand <laughs> and we did uh the cave diving and my wife had to like kind of trick me into doing it. And I was like, ah, it sounds real Not cool. cool. <laughs> it sounded cool. It looked cool. And there was only a couple of times where I was like freaking out. And well, you're like, in cl closed spaces and underwater. Yeah. Well, no, we were underwater. This was, oh, okay. it wasn't like cave diving water. It was just caves. Uh, oh, okay. And you were just walking through and I guess it's called squeezing. Through. Yeah. Yeah. So spelunking. Spelunking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, such a weird name. It is. It? And uh, there was only one time where I like had to like compose myself and like, talk myself out of freaking wow. out but uh yeah i don't like it's that. so weird i'm so i'm such a judgmental son of a gun that there's a part of me that looks it's at youtube you can say bitch, <laughs> son of a bitch right i just i honestly i don't i just don't really curse much okay. i don't have a problem with it okay. i just look at it like general vulgarity it's just never been something Fair i've enough. done yeah, i wouldn't i don't say, know i would never say this i don't right. i don't know i don't know what it is i always i, I self-censor i'd rather self-censor and have somebody else censor yeah. me i guess <laughs> um anyway i'm so judgmental that I, I look at people who go through things like depression or claustrophobia, things that I've never experienced, or I don't think I've experienced. Right. And and it go, goes back to that condescending thing you were talking about. I don't want to come across as condescending, but it's so difficult for me totally. to understand, like, How? what are you going through? Because right. yeah. I, I can't even, like, I don't it's know. so abstract. I wish I knew. <laughs> yeah, it's so abstract. I've got nothing that I can pin it to, because somebody would be like, oh, it's like that feeling when you do X, Y, or Z. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know those, uh, you know those Halloween, uh, things where you can like put yourself in a coffin, like you go to like the, the carnivals or like, okay. the, I don't celebrate you, Halloween, but you don't celebrate like, Halloween. I don't celebrate Halloween. I don't celebrate Christmas. So there, I don't celebrate, I don't celebrate Easter. So there's pretty the, much all the holidays. When you go to celebrate. like the haunted hay rides or whatever, there's always like this attraction where you pay $5 and they lock okay. you into a, this a, a is coffin not an attraction for and, you. I'm and video <laughs> debut. And my wife always like tries to, well, tries to get a pool of money. Like how much can we get to you to go in there? I'm like, I am not, there's no possible way I'm getting in there. But, yeah. That's pretty funny. Only irrational cool. fear, I think. No, that's that's a good one, yeah. though. I'm glad. I'm, I'm always happy to have some kind of irrational fear than, yeah. than just nothing at all. Cool, man. I appreciate you being here, dude. Hey, I really man. appreciate it. This My was pleasure. fun. This was good. I tried not to be too terrible. You guys have to go follow this man on Instagram. Check out his work. It's legit stuff. It's good stuff. If I do some stuff regarding photography, maybe, maybe not in the future on YouTube, I got to get you involved. Yeah, we got to talk lighting and show lighting and do Let stuff or build a course or something. Because you man. got some knowledge in that coconut of yours that I want to get out. I, uh, yeah, I'm in. Cool. Let me know. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for checking this one out. I will, uh, I'll see you in the next one, and you'll hear me in the next one. Justin, thanks, man. No problem, dude. Hey, before you go, thanks for checking out my podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to the show using the iTunes link in the video description below. While you're there, 
I would love it if you would give this podcast an honest review on iTunes. The ratings and reviews are really cool to see. If you don't think the show is worth five stars, well, let's just pretend it is. Don't forget, new podcasts arrive every Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with an occasional surprise show on Tuesdays. Until next time, this was The Dodcast.